Yeah, it's rare that uh, I don't need to explain the word. Because you say, uh, we, when we first moved to uh, Glenside, we opened a bank account, and the lady asked us, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to be professor of apologetics at Westminster. Oh, she said, it's wonderful. I mean, our young people just, they don't know how to say I'm sorry. <laughs> no, dear. Well, there is actually a relation, but that's, it's, yeah. We don't regret our Christian faith, do we? Um, someone um, foolishly, as you will see, asked me to say a bit more about um, my own journey. And I'm, I'm, in this, I'm very much like Calvin and not Luther. But um, I, I'd be glad to tell you uh, a, a few things. My, my parents met during the war, that is the Second World War, um, and uh, Dad was stationed in an officer training camp in Wilmington, North Carolina, which has recently been in the news because of the hurricane. Um, and um, they fell in love and had me, so I'm a war baby. Um, my brother was born after the war, and he's a boomer, and he thinks that makes a big difference. I never understood those <laughs> things. There. But anyway, um, the, he, he left the uh, military and went into business, and his business... Uh, was the telegraph. Um, so I don't know if you remember those, <laughs> but um, up until recently, it was a very widespread form of communication, and it's been replaced by everything else. But um, the company moved him to Paris, um, where I grew up as a little boy, and they sent me to French school because um, they wanted me you know, to be bilingual. Um, so it's an enormous privilege. We, they were not evangelical Christians. My mom did go to church. Dad did not. Um, so I didn't know a whole lot about the Christian faith um, until I was 19 years old, halfway through college. And one of my professors was a believer and um, taught his course from a Christian point of view. And I got to know him pretty well. And he thought I needed to visit his friend Francis Schaeffer in Labrie. La and I, we were, I was going to Switzerland anyway. So um, one extraordinary weekend, I went down to Labrie and had my whole life turned upside down. And, um, and then um, uh, decided I needed to learn more about this new faith I had. And so one place to do that is seminary. And so a whole bunch of us had heard couple of speakers from Westminster. Um, maybe the most um, outstanding was Edmund Clowney. But we had read uh, Van Til's material, and um, we just decided we, the place to go was Westminster. And we were not disappointed. We went there, and I graduated in 69. Um, and um, then, what do you do with a seminary degree? I became a school teacher. Uh, and I taught uh, French music and philosophy in a nice private school that wasn't a Christian school, but it was a fine um, day school in Greenwich, Connecticut. And I had considerable freedom to teach what I wanted, um, I mean, my point of view. And then at the end of the, um, se that time, it was eight years, I received a letter from this little seminary in Aix-en-Provence, which I knew a little bit about, um, that had that long name. It, it's now, today, it's John Calvin, um, asking if I would consider coming over to teach apologetics. And uh, they wanted a French-speaking Vantillion. So I, th I think they scoured the earth. <laughs> they found one. Uh, but uh, we decided for all kinds of reasons, including the fact my parents were living in Geneva at that point. To, to move to X, and we spent a decade of wonderful years there teaching at the seminary, and then um, for various reasons decided to come back to the States, and I took up a position at Westminster 30 years ago, where I am now. And um, it's been an honor to serve on that faculty and, um, and to teach apologetics, um, Vantillian apologetics in English. <laughs> so, uh, 
that's, that's my story. I'm blissfully married to Barbara, um, and we have two children married and three grandchildren. And I can't believe this, but our eldest grandchild is looking at colleges this year. Um, we, we don't age, but the other people seem to, you know. <laughs> okay, back to our subject at hand. Um, th I've entitled this Tragedy and, and Triumph because um, we're going to go through some difficult times and then emerge with a temporary reprieve, um, which is known as the Edict of Nantes. And um, for the rest of the story, uh, I'll be telling it tomorrow in Sunday school. Now, if we have time, I might anticipate that a little bit, because it's very significant um, for today. Uh, because after the reprieve, there was another regress that was very, very serious. Um, so f first, uh, why, after such a strong start, did French Protestantism not take root, ultimately? Um, well, it almost did. Um, it took a while for the different fledgling groups that Biza talked about, and the ones that he wasn't aware of, that were more organized, to become fully mature churches. Um, up until 19... Up until 1555, we see a few churches with the full complement of pastors, sacraments, discipline, and so forth. Then suddenly, from 55 to 60, um, a, a burgeoning, a, a, a boom. Uh, secret meetings became public. Unorganized communities became fully organized. Uh, pastors and elders, worship became regular. Uh, churches grew all over France. Um, by 1561, we may count at over a thousand mature church bodies, and later more than that. And uh, we, we did mention Calvin, and uh, what was his role? First, he was supremely concerned for the church in his native country. As I mentioned earlier, he was French. Um, and um, a lot of French people are, as would be Americans, are, are, are nationalistic. Uh, and Calvin was very loyal to his homeland. Um, but he, um, he was deeply concerned for the churches in his native country and was frankly worried that they wouldn't be up to the task. Um, July 24, 1547, he wrote a circular letter to the faithful of France, urging them, get this, to stay small. Um, he, was, he was not a church growth kind of guy. Um, if they really wanted, uh, he could send them some doctrinal guidelines to go by. Um, and, uh, but then they, would f they should flee the mass if they wanted to take communion and come to Geneva. So uh, these are high standards were difficult to implement. And, and historians are in disagreement over what was going on in Calvin's mind. Um, did he not have confidence that God could provide? Was he just super cautious? Did he feel that um, Geneva was the, the, the only place where things were happening because there was a certain amount of control? Um, very difficult to evaluate. Uh, but he didn't get his wish, at least not completely. And um, one of the reasons is that the churches in France wanted to grow into mature people without going to Geneva which is understandable. And one of the presenting issues was baptism. Um, now, it's, it is true that uh, the Reformed people accepted Catholic baptism and didn't oblige them to get rebaptized. 
But then what about newborns? Well, they didn't want to present them to the Roman Catholic curate. So here's what happened. Uh, the sieur of La Ferrière, the sire of La Ferrière, came to Paris in 1555 to have his child baptized. He just couldn't go to Geneva, or didn't want to. But nor would he submit his child to a, a Catholic. So he gathered a group of faithful people, found a wonderful leader named Jean Le Masson de Launay, um, who was considered legitimate because he was trained in Lausanne and then Geneva. And they elected him as pastor. Then they constituted a board of elders, a consistory, and then they baptized the child. Maybe a little irregular, but in these times of real hardship, um, you know, that, that's a favorite Presbyterian word, isn't it? Irregular. Uh, but uh, they, had, um, they had challenges, and this was one of the ways uh, to, to meet them. Um, now, having said that, they did model their church on the Genevan model, after the Genevan pattern. And then others came rapidly in succession. Um, so that was baptism. And then a church discipline issue forced the pastors around the town of Poitiers to come together and, in effect, form a presbytery. So you know that in our system, um, we have three levels of church courts. Um, we have the local session, and then we have what we call the presbytery, which is um, sessions in a particular geographical area. And then we have the general assembly, which is all of uh, all the, the, the elders together. And there's variants, variations on this. Um, this system was first created the 26th to 29th of May in 1559, held in Paris and known as the First Synod, or what we call General Assembly. There were 72 churches represented, uh, and others by absentee ballot. Um, and uh, there were actually two issues. One was a, some, a discipline case that the session found itself unable to, to answer, and they went to the presbytery, and they decided to go to a large meeting for it, and they resolved it. But second, the need for a confession of faith. Now, this was um, a kind of dramatic moment. Um, Calvin was unhappy that they wanted a confession of faith because he thought they weren't ready for it. They weren't mature enough. But after a lot of pressure, he agreed to draft it. <laughs> um, and um, this was, I think, a, another sign of French independence. Um, you know, they just weren't going to do everything Calvin wanted or thought. Um, and this synod is very significant. Um, it met in Paris, though it was supposed to meet in La Rochelle on the coast, but the, there was su such persecution there that they went to the Rue Visconti, which you can visit today. There's no signs of what the synod was. It's a funny set of apartment buildings, but it's, it's there. Um, and um, they drafted what we call today the Gallican Confession, or the French call it La Confession Dite de La Rochelle, uh, the confession as we call it of La Rochelle, because it was, it was, from, it was written in Paris. Um, now, um, historians argue pretty convincingly that this was the first uh, reformed uh, church and its pattern of synodical government and parity of elders became a model for all of Presbyterianism ever since. Uh, so unlike Lutheranism, which kept bishops and so forth, 
the, the Presbyterian system believes in the parity of elders. That means that every elder is equal. Now, some are more equal than others because um, uh, in some churches they, they give the pastor uh, a, a more prominent role. But the theory is that elders are elders. And um, even the, the elder who is not the main preacher is supposed to be apt to teach. And however you spell this out, there's different variants on it, this is a radical idea. Um, radically different from the hierarchical model of the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, as, as evidence of this, not only do we not have bishops, but we have a moderator, so that which, which term means he's there to moderate. Uh, and in America, we've adopted the Robert's Rules of Order, which are really a very good way of safeguarding that equality of, of the elders. Um, and the moderator, if, if he's good, um, will, will not allow sir, uh, any disorder. Uh, he will not allow motions to come without a second. You know, he just keeps order, but he's not a bishop. Um, it has been argued that um, the Presbyterian synodical model had something to do with the emerging concept of democracy, or more accurately, republicanism. Um, because the, the idea in a democracy is that the, the people, by covenant, um, rule through their moderators. Now, you know, as a, as a pretty conservative person, I know this gets out of hand, and you know, the, the government has taken more and more kind of authority on it, on, but it, uh, we, we don't have a king, we have a president. Um, and uh, we have a division of, of um, between branches of government and a, a putative safeguard system um, where um, no one branch can, can reign over the other. Now, there are problems, and we don't need to get into that today because it would be too depressing. But um, uh, that, that, that synod was really one of the factors that fed into modern um, democracy. Um, and then, in the next couple of years, is really the high point of um, French Protestantism, or Huguenot faith. It is possible that by 1562, there were 2,150 churches, counting over 3 million believers in, um, in the whole country. Um, and and what, were the, what were the factors of the growth? As, as we saw, there was a certain indigenous energy and independence. But admittedly, Geneva had uh, considerable influence. Something like 88 missionaries were sent from Geneva to France between 55 and 62. And most of them were French people who had fled to Geneva for refuge. Now, if you visit the city of Geneva, which, which I hope some of you will be able to do, um, and you go to St. Peter's Church, not cathedral, and you stand on the steps and you turn your back to the church, you'll see in front of you a, a set of buildings. And it's quite obvious that the first two floors have the same architecture, but the next two floors are different. And the reason is they had to build extra space because of the refugees. And uh, Geneva received uh, just hundreds of, uh, of refugees fleeing for protection. But in the bargain, their leaders got educated in um, the seminary. Now, another thing that happened in 1559 was um, Calvin and then his, his right-hand man, Theodore Beza, founded uh, the University of Geneva, where I study. And in, at the beginning, it was just a place, not just, it was a place to train ministers. Um, and um, Lausanne had, had one of its own under Viret. Um, and during this period, these leaders trained in order to go back to France. And um, they put into practice 
all that they had learned, both at the academy and what they saw practiced in the churches. Um, now, unless we do it today, we'll do it tomorrow, I'll talk about the desert period where they were still being trained in Geneva and Lausanne. And the diploma was called a certificate of death. You know, going back, they, the, the risk was enormous that they wouldn't keep their lives. Um, but even in this day, um, they had to be, some of this had to be done secretly because Henry II of France accused the Genevan government of sending spies to France. Collusion, right? Uh, for its eventual overthrow. Um, and the council in Geneva, in, in all honesty, said, this is not what we're doing, training pastors. Um, then, um, so the church just grew. And um, this is the period of time that historians look back to as the high watermark, the, the, the period of time when it looked like the country was going to be swayed. It didn't happen. Uh, first of all, persecution set in. Uh, of the 88 that I talked about, many of them were put to death violently. Um, there was um, a number of martyrs. Two incidents or moments of this one is called the, the Lausanne Five. These were people who had trained in Switzerland, and in 1552, they went to Lyon, which is in the center of France, and it's a bastion of Catholicism, to um, plant Protestant churches and pastor them. Uh, they were detained on their way and kept from doing their work and kept in, in jail and uh, accused of heresy and um, told they were going to um, die. Calvin wrote passionate letters in their defense. One of Calvin's talents was his global outreach and his diplomacy, and he was often intervening in international affairs to try to accomplish the purposes of the gospel. Um, he also wrote to these young men, and his, his early letters say, just, just hang on, hold on. God is testing you. But then when it became clear they would not survive, he gave them pastoral advice on the honor of martyrdom. And uh, they were burned at the stake. Um, our little Reformed church in Aix-en-Provence, where we invested a lot of our lives, has a letter from John Calvin urging them to persevere during pers the persecutions that they were experiencing. You know, 500 years later, congregation is still going. Um, so there was a lot of that opposition. Um, and then the, the other thing I'll just mention is Jean Crespin wrote a famous book of the martyrs. Um, and um, he, he wrote it about these young men and also some others. On the 5th of September, 1557, there was something called the, the matter, the affair, l'affaire of the Rue Saint-Jacques, the, 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 uh, the matter of the St. James Road in Paris. Um, after a defeat of the French in the Battle of Saint-Quentin in July, there was fear and suspicion leading to something like a pogrom against Protestants. Right? When you... When things don't go well, you look for a scapegoat. You know, 9-11. Who, who did it? Why? Um, I'll, I'll just say in parentheses, Augustine's masterpiece, The, the uh, City of God, was written partly to answer the challenge that was widespread at the time, that the reason that Rome fell was because of the Christians. Here's the argument, believe it or not. Um, so every city in the ancient world was protected by a god or a pantheon of god. And Rome was the greatest pantheon of the gods, 
headed by Zeus himself. When Christians came to the city, their God refused to be in the Pantheon because he was the creator of the universe. And so uh, he wouldn't play ball, and the other gods just stopped protecting the city. So Augustine writes this incredible masterpiece saying that they have it completely upside down. So you, you, you and, and the Protestants were uh, scapegoats because they were perceived to, not only to be heretics doctrinally, but to break up the unity, the supposed unity of, of France. Um, and um, a group of 400 of them were discovered worshiping secretly in this Rue Saint-Jacques. A number escaped, but 130, mostly women, were arrested. Interestingly, many of them were high-born, but despite Calvin's pleas, six of them were sent to the stake. And um, Crespin chronicles some of these uh, martyrdoms um, you know, Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, is part, owes something to this Crespin. And uh, reading it is like uh, a, 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 littered, a litany of um, tragic things that, that happen, but it's, it's very glorious because he, he lists their courage. Well, despite these repressions, or was it because of them, the church grew and grew. And um, some French people said, we're being unjust here, and uh, let's leave these Protestants alone. Um, then a tragic event occurred. And that, when I you know, asked why in his dark providence God allowed this, is he does, and we don't always know the reasons. Um, a colloquy was called in the city of Poissy, now, the king, King Charles, was too young to run the country. So his famous mother, Catherine of Medici, um, was basically running the country. And um, they, at first, um, wanted to try to guarantee some degree of freedom to the Protestants. Uh, and... They thought to do this, we should have a meeting between the two and see where we agree and where we disagree. And they, they, they called the meeting at Poissy. The Pope was very worried about this meeting uh, because, as is often said, he considered France the eldest daughter of the church. Um, he was also desperately hoping that what happened in England, uh, where... Uh, Henry VIII broke with the Church of Rome, would not happen in France. Um, and there were hopeful signs. All of the participants were French people, and all of them seemed committed to unifying the country. It wasn't, a, it wasn't exactly a church council. Uh, it was more, something more modest. But things began well and then ended terribly. A good deal of the controversy surrounded the Lord's Supper. Um, why is this the case? Uh, I think the Lord's Supper re represents really not only the, a high point next to the preaching of the word of our, of our worship of God, but the answer to the mass. So there's a lot of controversy surrounding the Lord's Supper about it. And um, in our presbytery, we always ask the young man for his views on the Lord's table, you know, and um, uh, it's, it just is enormously important. Here, the question came up, when Jesus said, this is my body, what does it mean? The Catholic side said, it means that somehow Jesus came down from heaven and inhabited the elements. Um, the Protestants had advanced their cause by denying earthly representations of heavenly truths. And uh, there were hard feelings about this. Um, 
And um, so it was a volatile issue. Um, and um, Catherine said she was willing to give up some parts of the Catholic tradition to, in order to conciliate with the Protestants. Biza was there. He was treated with some respect, although the decks were stacked against them. They had to stand. The Catholics were allowed to sit. And to stand meant you were being accused. Um, and after several learned discourses on this question, at a crucial moment, Biza said, we say his body as, is as far removed from the bread and the wine as the highest heaven is removed from the earth. At these words, to quote one historian, cardinals, bishops, doctors of the Sorbonne began to express their dissent in loud and violent tones. And amid, amid the din that instantly arose, Biza's voice was drowned out for the time. And the only intelligible words that could be made out were exclamations of, he has blasphemed, he has blasphemed God, coming from the ecclesiastics. And so uh, that was the end of the colloquy. And um, it, was, it was tragic. I don't know that there was a, a way around it. Historians debate. One, one French historian thinks that Theodore Biza was provocative. Well, um, he was standing by his convictions. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard to attribute motives. But um, there was no way in which um, Christ coming down from heaven inhabiting the elements was going to be agreeable to Christ staying in heaven, even though we believe in the real presence and the Holy Spirit is, is active in the ceremony, um, the elements aren't affected as such. So that division became um, very, very uh, exaggerated, not exaggerated, but just volatile. And that began the so-called wars of religion. Uh, 36 bloody years of conflict between Catholics and Huguenots. Now, in those days, um, countries and regions were divided according to whether you were Protestant or Catholic. And uh, this was not just a church presence. This was a government thing. Even today, Switzerland has Catholic and Protestant cantons. I'll, I'll, I'll make a little parenthesis here, because I think we have time. The person who led me to Christ, um, Francis Schaeffer, was actually kicked out of a Catholic canton, the Valais, as the letter said, uh, for, for reasons of religious dissidence. And uh, it's a long story. It's a beautiful story, because the Lord obviously intervened. And in the fine print, it says, you have to leave the country uh, in a few weeks unless you can relocate in a Protestant canton. And so Edith Schaefer, who is one of our heroines, um, with lots of prayer and perseverance and doggedness, went down the valley and up to the uh, Protestant canton of Vaux and um, found a real estate agent and says, anything available here? Long story short, uh, you should read it in the La Brie story. It's beautiful. There was this amazing chalet. And uh, Edith sort of said, uh, what's the rent? And the lady said, it's not for rent, it's for sale. And what's it for? 10,000 francs. That was a lot of money in those days, a lot of clams. So uh, Edith, undaunted, Schaefer, Fran Francis said, come on, this is ridiculous, uh, prayed, and, and this money came in by the raven. So that is to say that even in the 1940s and 50s, the the feelings were not just between mentalities and cultures, but governments. Um, and um, so we're very far away from the complete relativism and indifference of today. And in, and in these times, um, not only were they divided regionally, but the divisions, they, they had armies. And, um, you know, there's a lot of disagreement as, as to who was worse, the Catholics or the Huguenots. Of course, many of us think the Catholics were really bad. 
Um, this is a little gross, but, uh, but uh, the, the, the Catholic generals told them to cut off the tongues of the Huguenots so they couldn't sing the psalms, because that was their biggest secret weapon. Wow, we just sang one. That was a secret weapon. Um, anyway, uh, key families and military leaders were involved. Catherine, who was trying so hard to be conciliatory, hardened and began to sympathize with the Roman Catholics, particularly the House of Guise, or Guise, G-U-I-S-E, um, which was a very strong um, lordship of fiercely Catholic uh, nobility. And um, the, the sad uh, climax of these wars was, of course, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, August 24th, 1572. Um, it's one of the most noted incidents in all of religious history, uh, and for various reasons, set the tone for some degree of conciliation to come. What was the cause? Well, they varied. Uh, one of them was the disfavor of the Guise family. Even though they were staunch Catholics, or maybe because they were staunch Catholics, um, they, uh, they, they were hated. They were powerful, they were rich, and even their fellow Catholics hated them. One day, the Duke de Guise was thrown out of the window of his apartment and mutilated. And uh, so that was the feeling. On the other side, uh, the Protestant family, the Colignys, led by Admiral Gaspard de Coligny, um, was doing pretty well. They were readmitted to the court and to the, the king's council. And, Ca and Catherine, though she was beginning to side with the Catholics, was a pragmatist. So she, she valued the strength of the Protestants their love of the country, and their wisdom in government. And she even orchestrated the marriage between her daughter, Margaret, to the Protestant prince, Henri, who became Henri IV, Henry IV, who's a very important figure for reasons I will tell you. Um, the Catholics, or the least extreme ones, and the Pope himself were fiercely opposed to this marriage. But then the Protestants were understood to uh, edge over to the wrong side. And they became critical even of the king. I know, it's, uh, it is sad. Um, and um, uh, things began to turn. Uh, and Calvin had argued in a number of places, particularly readings on Daniel, that king, even kings, could automatically abdicate their position when they weren't faithful as, as the servants of God. And, uh, and so people began to resent the Protestants after readmitting them. Anyway, crazy atmosphere, feelings ran high. Um, some Catholics thought the Protestants were trying to get rid of the very existence of a Gallican monarchy. And there was an attempt on Coligny's life he was wounded seriously, but didn't die immediately. Finally, Charles killed off several Protestant leaders, including Coligny, who was dragged out of bed and assassinated. There followed a great ma massacre. Over 2,000 were killed in Paris, and probably over 10,000 or more around the country. Um, a lot of Wonderful people were martyred. I mean, anybody is wonderful who's in the image of God. But one of them was Petrus Ramos. Um, you, may, you may not know this figure. Uh, he, was, um, he was murdered on the third day, stabbed while at his prayers. He was a logician who ordered human thought, as he claimed, uh, after God's own. And, um, you know, we have this expression, thinking God's thoughts after him. And one of his um, 
accomplishments was uh, a sort of a binary view of, um, of how to think, which influenced the Westminster Confession of Faith. Because if you look at the lar larger catechism, um, it'll say, after each of the Ten Commandments, what is forbidden in this commandment and what is commanded. It's a Ramistic binary organization. I mean, it's also true, but it's, it's, uh, it's, they, it's a direct relation between Ramas and, um, and the divines. And he, he, you know, he was just a remarkable figure. He wasn't the only one. Um, so uh, then uh, this became, this, mar this massacre became a, a cause célèbre. Uh, it was dramatized in La Reine Margot. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Um, Margaret, wife of Henry IV, um, was apparently not really in love with, with him. Uh, and it was, a, it was very anti-Catherine who forced the marriage. Um, and uh, there were all kinds of plays based on this and so forth. The event, though, greatly limited the influence of Protestants. Um, at the same time, that said, it printed on Protestant minds the indelible conviction that Catholicism was bloody and treacherous. Uh, that's, uh, Owen Chadwick says that. Um, so this um, was so shocking that um, the thirst for blood and the, the, the fear of, of what could happen when people are let loose suddenly gained the consciousness of, of folks and, and the wars were stopped. And then Henry IV, Henry of Navarre, who was a Protestant, ascended to the throne. It's a, one of God's providential acts. Um, and um, he was, a, he was a, an amazing warrior. Um, he won all these battles around France. And uh, he finally captured Paris. And um, he would give us the toleration edict, the Edict of Nantes. Now, he's a mixed figure because uh, some people see him as a marvelous pragmatist. He decided to convert to Catholicism in order to get everybody in sympathy, um, uh, including the Catholics. And he figured he couldn't succeed in a peace edict without himself becoming a Catholic. He may or may not have said, Paris is worth a mass. That's a famous statement, a tribute to him. Um, now, here's another bit of, I think, folklore, but it's, it's very telling. The great historian Agrippa d'Aubigny is, uh, is said to have come to him when he did this. And he apparently had a sore on his lip, you know, as we all get them. And you have to have guts to say this to a king. He said, today you have denied Christ with your lips, and God is judging you on your lips. The day may come when you'll deny him in your heart, and God will judge you on your heart. He was stabbed to death by a crazy man. But not, um, and so there's controversy. You know, m most of my f Protestant friends think he's a traitor. And um, um, that, he, that, you know, it was his fault that things didn't go as well as they could have. But he, you, you'll have to read the history and decide for yourself. The greatest thing that he did was uh, to legislate or to create the legislation known as the Edict of Nantes. It was published in 1598. So after all these wars of religion, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, conquest of Paris, becoming a Catholic, he wrote an edict, which was a toleration edict. Um, it was an imperfect truce. Um, private worship freedom of conscience 
was allowed. And before that, it, it hadn't been. That meant that um, you could believe what you wanted. That is, you could be Catholic or Protestant in your, in your conscience. But public worship was only tolerated in, 20, in 200 towns around France. Um, there, they were aw- allowed to gather and worship. They were allowed to own property, to trade, to be treated in hospitals, um, and they were given full amnesty for any crimes they had committed in war. Um, this was a, a high point, perhaps, in French Protestant life. Um, and it lasted for maybe not quite a, a, a century. Um, maybe I'll, I'll spill into it tomorrow so, because, you know, the end of the story is, is important. But um, it lasted um, with a, a degree of success um, because the Protestants really took advantage of this. Um, and um, yet, though there was tolerance, there was a slow movement towards the, an absolute monarchy, the rise of absolutism. Um, after Henri IV was assassinated, his, Louis the Thirteenth, and then especially Louis the Fourteenth, became powerful beyond wor- words. It was the a- the high point of the French Enlightenment. French classical culture featured the preeminence of Paris rather than Rome as the cultural and ar- artistic center of Europe. Um, I don't know if you've been watching this television series on Versailles, or maybe you've been to Versailles. But um, think of Versailles, uh, this extravagant uh, castle or or chateau where the king had one of his residences. Or think of the Louvre. It was was an era of um, complete, over-the-top extravagance. He called himself the Sun King. And... um, you know, there were remarkable achievements. Um, the Moliere, the, you know, the playwright, or Racine, Corneille. It was the century of Descartes. Um, it was a century of great Catholic resurgence. And um, as the, the move towards this Enlightenment mentality and the Sun King progressed, the king allowed himself to be convinced that the Huguenots were of no account, little or no account. And in 1685, he, um, he revoked the Edict of Nantes with something called the Edict of Fontainebleau. Um, it was all wrong. There were plenty of believers around, who Huguenots around, and they were of great significance. Um, but he, m- some people think out of guilt, because he wasn't as good a Catholic as he should have been, and this is a way of appeasing the, the Pope. Some people think out of just sheer greed for power and, and absolutism, um, he, he, he centralized all of French government, which included the church, uh, included the army, included the finances, included building these extravagant places. And um, unlike countries such as Holland or or Great Britain, or even Germany, um, France became this uh, hideous strength. Um, And um, then ensued um, brutal consequences against the Protestants. Protestantism was declared an illegal religion, much like before uh, Milan, Christianity was illicit in the first three centuries. And it was called the RPR, Religion Prétendue Reformée, the pretended reformed religion. And uh, Protestants were given three weeks to recant and come back to the fold. If they did not, 
then they, they were liable to death, to prison, or to row themselves uh, to death on the king's war galleys. Even women, um, for the crime of owning and reading a Bible, uh, were liable to prison, and the king would send dragoons into the Protestant strongholds, and they were allowed to quarter in the, the French households and to take advantage of, of the women. And so, uh, of course, some did recant and went back. Um, and there was a big debate as to whether God would still love them and did they do it with their fingers crossed and so forth. Long, long story. Um, others left and fled to right here, South Carolina, South Africa, Holland, London, Germany, many, many other places. As we said earlier, forever impoverishing the French of one of the most talented groups that they've ever nurtured. But forever enriching the countries uh, to which they came. Enormous influence of the Huguenots on America, for example. By the way, somebody was asking me about Huguenot names. I thought of one that you'll all love. Davy Crockett. He was a Huguenot. Uh, king of the wild frontier. He was a lot more than that. He was actually a remarkable man. Um, so um, this initiated the period uh, of time that the French Protestants called the desert, le désert. We might call it the wilderness. Because if you didn't row yourself to death or you didn't escape to another country and you tried to stay faithful, um, you had... Uh, Decades of clandestine living. Uh, the most um, remarkable of this life in the desert was in the Cévennes Mountains in the southwest of France. And there, um, there would be secret worship services. Um, and uh, this is uh, kind of dramatic and folkloric almost. Um, they would go out to a, a, a cave or a grotto and uh, the winemakers would bring barrels, which if you unfold them, became pulpits. And you lift the thing in the back, and it, it becomes an, an overhead uh, projector uh, of sound, which is um, still used in some of the French Protestant churches, that, that form. But the sermon could be heard for a couple of miles around with this system. And... Um, they were not your 20-minute, um, you know, American 11 o'clock sermon. They were, some of them were a couple of hours long, but uh, very, very poignant and, um, and moving. Um, one thing I didn't s stress, but it's maybe important, when Calvin reformed worship in Geneva, he insisted on psalmody. It uh, wasn't quite exclusive because you were allowed to sing the creeds and the Song of Simeon and so forth, but it was basically exclusive. And um, these psalms uh, were beautiful, powerful, austere. Um, you know, all people that are on earth to dwell, so old hundreds we call it, is, is by Louis Bourgeois, the great French Psalter composer. And the, the Huguenots had basically memorized all these psalms. But in case they hadn't, um, the women hid psalters in their chignons, in their hair, and brought them out. And even today, when, when we were living in France, um, the true French Protestant woman has to wear a chignon. Uh, you know how these things go. Um, but, you know, you, that, it was clandestine worship. And um, if you, again, want to travel and see some of this, there's an extraordinary museum called the Musée du Désert, the Desert Museum, in Anduze, which is near the center of all of this. And it's, ba it's a house that was a house where you could hide from the king's dragoons. And they've, they've, they've kept the secret panels, uh, the basement exits, uh, the, the secret closets where they hid Bibles and, and so forth. And it, it's, it's very moving. And in one room, it has a large ore 
from the galleys, and it has the names of all the known m martyrs. And I, I've, I've taken groups there, um, and people look for their ancestors, you know, move to tears. Um, and then um, this all came to an end, and this I will talk about pretty much tomorrow, when uh, the king ran out of power, rationalism began to succeed over Catholicism, and the rights of man began to trump the uh, sort of rhetoric of belonging to the Catholic Church. But, tragically, um, the purging of this corrupt system was worse, the cure was worse than, than the cause. It was the French Revolution, and in which, again, thousands of people died in the name of human reason and um, not in the name of, of, you know, reformation at all. Now, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about what happened since, but that tragic era did end, and Napoleon finally put some order into the whole thing, and, and there was a, a, a period of relative restoration. But it's the, um, you know, it's the tragedy part of the tragedy and triumph, because um, people just think, what could have been? Um, one, is, one French historian thinks that the Huguenots lost some of their zeal. You know, like the Ephesian church, and they lost their first love. It's harsh, but, you know, maybe, maybe there was some of that. You know, when, when things start going well, it's a sad truth, isn't it? We get, com we get comfortable. Um, but um, there were other factors at work as well. Um, there, were, there were doctrinal issues. Um, you know, Amaraldianism and others began to compromise the sovereignty of God. Uh, but mostly there was this centralizing monster that could not abide any form of dissidence. Um, Os Guinness has written a really good book on, it's called Last Call for Liberty. And in it he argues, based on a, many, many different historians, that those countries which embraced the Reformation were able on the whole to come into modernity with uh, dispute, disagreement, debate, but not bloody revolution. Those countries which did not uh, abandon that Baroque monarchy and Catholic collusion, France, Italy, um, Poland, you name it, and then Russia, in, in the case of the Orthodox Church, came to modernity in, in, in bloody ways because um, debate, going back to that synod, is a, is a Protestant tradition. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Um, uh, a little sad to end this way, but uh, I'll be glad to tell you that, you know, some of the good stuff that happened through it, and then later, um, uh, tomorrow, w what's happening today that's it's not, not at all all bad news. So, questions, discussion? Yes? Uh, St. Peter's Church is still there? Oh, very mm -hmm. much so. Uh, is it still pretty solid? Is no, it's quite liberal. Um, Sad to say, much of the Reformed Church, particularly in the big cities, has gone um, liberal, neo-Orthodox. Uh, the faithful churches, there's a few congregations that are really faithful, but the faithful ones are, are your independent churches, your brethren, your Baptists, and, and, and so forth. So it's a hard church, a hard choice. My, I have a friend who lives in Lausanne, and you know, the, the cathedral there, which is a church also, uh, is now liberal. And, and so he goes to a little old Baptist church and um, it's preach the gospel, faithful people. But they don't have all of the, you know, the cultural impact that he would like. Um, yeah, it's a very sad thing. And my, uh, my friend Olivier Fascio, he actually pastored a church just because it was, he was worried about the way it's going in the reform system. But it's largely... I mean, this is, you can argue back and forth about whether a church ought to be controlled by the state. But in Switzerland, almost all the major churches are, and 